the, the creed advances to describe, now what about this Jesus? What did he do? What, what do we believe about his life? And it begins with the question of the incarnation. He is going to have to come and take upon himself the humanness which the human race has now caused itself to be. In other words, this decaying and dying thing in order to exhaust the power of that decay and death by taking it upon himself in order to bring about new creation. At the incarnation, he emptied himself, as St. Paul says in Philippians 2. He became incarnate. That does not mean he ceased to be God, but in his earthly life, his Godhead was hidden, hidden under the veil of the flesh. And so he did not lay aside his Godhead. That would be a wrong interpretation of Philippians 2. But he agreed to, as it were, restrain its revelation and its use. So he accepted to be humiliated, to be vulnerable, to be weak. And he was obedient even to death. God will come and will take its woes, its pain, its death upon himself. So incarnation is absolutely central to the whole Christian message. St. John's Gospel tells us that the Word became flesh. And that means that we are dealing with a God who doesn't remain distant from us, but who chooses to enter into our history in Jesus Christ in order to redeem us. It's saying that Jesus is not simply a great teacher, not just a great prophet, but rather that in Jesus we see God entering into our human situation in order to deliver us from it. If I could put it like this, God entered into our world to take us into his world. He came to where we are to bring us to where he wants us to be. The incarnation is all about a God who enters into this world to bring us safely into the new Jerusalem. Jesus is uh, uh, the unique son of God and the phrase that highlights the uniqueness uh, in the Apostles' Creed is that he was conceived by the Holy Ghost. When Christians in the Creed say that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary, they are reaching for human words that deal with mysteries that are beyond us. But when we've said that, he was born in the way that every human child is born, came into the world through his mother's womb. The phrase born of the Virgin Mary emphasizes uh, the other side of the coin. Uh, to the phrase conceived of the Holy Ghost. Here is the human angle on the birth of Jesus Christ. From a divine angle conceived uh, by the Holy Ghost, from a human angle born of a virgin. In Matthew's Gospel, a story about Joseph being told that um, his, his wife is to have a child conceived by the Holy Spirit. In Luke's Gospel, a story about Mary being told um, that she is going to have a child that way. So Matthew's Gospel sees it from Joseph's point of view and Luke's Gospel sees it from Mary's point of view. That's interesting for another reason, which is that those stories are quite clearly not derived from one another. It isn't the case that Matthew has read Luke or Luke has read Matthew and he's just produced a different version of the same tale. They're quite different stories. So clearly from very early on in Christianity, there was this sense that Jesus' birth was, Jesus' conception was different. And the other thing to say about that is you can search back in Judaism for prophecies about a virgin birth, if you like. The closest that you get is one in Isaiah, but nobody reading Isaiah 7 in the two or three centuries before the time of Jesus, so far as we know, had ever said, there you are, this means that the Messiah is going to be born of a virgin. Nobody had actually read that passage in Isaiah 7 like that before. So it doesn't look as though, and this is what a lot of people have said, 
course. It doesn't, in fact, look as though um, everyone was expecting that a Messiah to be born of a virgin, so the early Christians made up that story to suit. It looks rather as though something very, very extraordinary happened, and in fear and trembling, they went off in search of as good biblical backup for it as they could, and they found that one passage in Isaiah 7. Nevertheless, for the fuller picture, when we stand back from the whole thing, we have to say, yes, this is actually how it happened. And I no more understand that in terms of contemporary science than I understand the resurrection in terms of contemporary science. And this is one thing we have to be very clear about. People have often said for the last 200 years, oh, they believed in all that sort of thing then because they were pre-scientific and they didn't know the laws of nature which is absolute rubbish, you see. People in the ancient world knew perfectly well that dead people do not rise from their tombs. Um, you know, Pliny said so, Aeschylus said so, Homer said so. All kinds of people in the ancient world comment on the fact that dead people don't rise. And the early Christians say, yes, but on this occasion he did. And in the same way, as C.S. Lewis said a generation ago, the reason Joseph was worried about Mary's pregnancy was not because he didn't know the laws of nature, but because he did. And uh, in other words, they were as shocked by this as we are. They were as ready to assume the worst about this as we are. And yet they went on and told that story. And the only reason I can see why they did was because it actually happened. And then when we explore what we need to say about Jesus, we discover that the only truth we can tell is that he really was and is a genuine human being and that he really was and is truly divine. And that's without adding a second divine being, as though there were now two gods, but that he is the human being in whom the one living God has become personally present with us. Now, there's a danger of going too far the other way, of thinking of God just as a pick in the form of Jesus as my buddy, my friend, somebody who, uh, who, who, who I'm, I'm chatty with, who, who perhaps I obey sometimes and other times I, I don't and so on. And, and that, that's to lose sight of the fact that... Uh, that the, the God that we see in Jesus is the same God as the sovereign creator of the universe. And we need to hold these two together, not one, not one without the other. Jesus is not part of the problem. He is its solution. And the idea of the virgin birth is setting out before us this fundamental idea that Jesus is not contaminated by sin, but rather he brings the remedy for sin in which we can share. So it isn't that I can start off in some philosophical framework and say, let's suppose for the sake of argument that there might be a world with a God like this and why would he become human and would he have to be totally divine? And We can't do it like that. We have to start off with Jesus, which is always a risk. Not everyone likes taking that risk because they say, how can we be sure about Jesus? And the answer is the same way that you're sure about all the things in the world that really matter by embracing them and by going with them and by testing them out and trusting them. The scripture has many wonderful uh, names for Jesus Christ, but uh, among them is the uh, idea and the concept that he is the second Adam. Uh, the book of Romans particularly has that uh, in its background. And uh, the significance of that is to say that he is uh, a human being as we are, just as the first Adam was, uh, but that unlike the first Adam, he did not disobey, but in his life, as the second Adam, he perfectly obeyed. And what Adam, as the first of all creation, lost for us in the Garden of Eden, Jesus, as the second Adam, restores for us and recovers for us in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross of Jerusalem. I like Hebrews chapter 4, verse, I think it's 15 here. For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. He really does understand. Uh, Jesus intercedes for us and he knows what it's like to be human. Um, he really can say, I know what it's like, because he really has been there. He really has done that. That is a help for us. Tempted in every way, truly human, and yet never sinned. Therefore, the only person who could take the responsibility, the penalty of our sins upon himself because he had no sins to pay for. Therefore, he's the perfect redeemer, the perfect savior, the God-man, Jesus Christ. And just as you build a bridge by coming from both ends of the spectrum, 
So here is this unique and wonderful gospel, which says the answer lies not in human beings trying to reach up to God, as in many religions they do, because we couldn't reach up far enough. Or even that God in his condescension merely reaches down to us. But that God fully enters into our humanity and redeems it and comes at the problem both ends of the spectrum at once. So he is the divine human being, unique son of God, bringing God's mercy and grace to us from that end, but fully entering into our humanity and sharing our experiences except for sin from the other end, uniquely qualifying him to be our saviour.